We want to finish up our series on uh, the health habits of a healthy soul this morning uh, before we start our new sermon series next week through the book of Colossians. And so um, this is your last time to hear about healthy souls, even though we should probably be regularly thinking about how to help our souls be healthy and how to care for our souls. But this has been a great series. It's been a weird series throughout the summer, but God has really used it in my life and I think in our church's life as he's grown our church, he's grown us as individuals, and just each week while it's kind of a different topic, it's really helped us hone in on some broader ideas. And so I, I hope that's the same for today. But now that it's September, we started this series in May, we've gone through the summer, and now it's September and it feels like fall outside, which I love. I love the fall. It's probably my favorite season. Um, If I had to pick one, between spring and fall, fall wins a little bit because I love the color change, the leaves. I love the briskness. I know I'm not really a pumpkin spice person. I don't don't live in that world, but I went to Starbucks the first day uh, for a meeting. I don't just go to Starbucks because it's not my favorite coffee, but I went to Starbucks for a meeting and I was trying to bring home some of my family, some of the new pumpkin things, and they were already sold out by 8.30 in the morning of pumpkin spice. So fall is here, spices are here, Halloween is here. And in fact, my dad was shopping at like a BJ's or a Sam's Club the other day. And you've noticed like Halloween decorations are all ready everywhere. Like it is, it is time to decorate for Halloween. And he posted a picture on his Facebook of a, of a bag of skulls. Like, you could buy, like, a bulk, like a Sam's Club BJ's bag of decorative skulls for your Halloween. I mean, it was, like, a big, like, you know, I used to carry soccer bags as a coach, like balls of soccer, like soccer balls, like, in in an athletic bag. That's what it looked like, a bag of skulls. And he said, I think Halloween's getting creepier and creepier every year. And that that reminded me of something I read really, really uh, recently, and that was that for many people, when they, when they think about a skull, a skeleton, but especially a skull, we think of, you know, the gothic side of things. We think of death. We think of a, a creepy imagery. And that, that is certainly something that is true as we think about that as being something that you'd associate with, with a biker gang or the gothy kid from high school. But in reality, the very first images that we have of paintings and graphics, the very first images of people with with these sort of skulls is actually early first century monastic monks. So in 500 AD, there was a picture of a kind of an order of the Benedict. It was a society of monks and all of their pictures was like them with a skull. Kind of weird, right? In fact, they would, they would, have, they would have this prayer desk, these 500 AD monks, they would have this prayer desk, desks where they would go and they would sit down to pray and then they would, um, they would have a candle and a Bible and a skull on their prayer desk. And I'm not talking about some like made in Taiwan plastic skull. I'm talking about like brother Joe who died a couple years ago and they, they just borrowed his head to put on his desk. Like that's weird, right? Like that's, this is not something you pick up at Hobby Lobby or Walmart. This is like, this is a real, sometimes somebody they knew who used to be one of their monks was sitting on their desk. That's dark to us. But there's a reason why they would do this. And I think it's actually a healthy reason. Not that we recommend you go to Walmart and buy a skull or especially go find a real one. The reason why they did this was because as they prayed, And as they read their Bibles, and as they focused on God, they wanted a physical reminder that life is short, things are temporary, and eternity is waiting. And what better imagery to say like, right now you are breathing and living and alive, but just like this person, there will be a time when your physical existence like this stops. And so for them, having a skull on the desk was an ever-present reminder of eternity. That eternity is coming and I should make my choices and live my life and do the things I need to do for God today. And in fact, the book of Psalms, long before the monks did that, the book of Psalms said the exact same thing. Psalm chapter 90 verse 14 says, teach us to number our days, to count 
our days carefully so that we can develop wisdom in our hearts. Number our days is the idea of realizing that you only have so many days, so many years, so many decades for life. So God, teach us to realize that life is short. And from that, there is wisdom. From that, there is an understanding in our hearts. And so that's where I have this idea of the habit of eternity. That you and I, for our souls to be healthy, we need to shift our minds from the momentary grind and pull of the temporary and the urgent so that way we can focus in on the larger reality that what matters is not necessarily this year or this day, but that day when we stand before God and we go into eternity. And so we need that ever, ever pulling reminder. In fact, a healthy soul It would refuse, we refuse to get so stuck in the moment. But we need to instead live in light of eternity. And just think about, just just practically, I think we get that. That if you really realize that that eternity is what's most important, that that, that, that it's not just temporary, but the forever is what's most important, it would change how we live our lives. Like the choices we make are different when we think about eternity. The, the habits we pull up, the attitudes we have, the kind of hope we cling to is different because of eternity. The kind of ambition we have that looks to what God wants and what we want is different when the idea of eternity is set before us. Certainly our endurance is different when we think about eternity. So we need, we have to, a healthy soul has to have a prospect and a look at eternity. And so that's what I want to get at today as we close out our sermon series. Just to give you one quick idea, when we talk about soul care, we've talked about this each week, but here's my quick definition. Soul care is this. It's taking your faith seriously and slowly, you know, not in a rush, so that way you see health in your beliefs, your body, your mind, your emotions, your relationships. All of you is impacted. And think about how an eternal perspective an eternal reminder will help you live like that today. So to do that, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 2. I don't know if I said that yet or not, but Philippians chapter 2, in the remaining time we have before we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we're going to look at Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 12. And so I want to read this to you. Um, one, of the, one of the important things to keep in mind about Philippians chapter 2 is that Paul, as he writes this letter, is facing execution. Paul is in prison. Paul is under arrest. Paul is literally, they are deciding whether they're going to kill him or free him. And so if you really want to have a perspective of eternity, having a possible execution, is a, it really opens up your mind to the reality of life after death, right? And so Paul is speaking from this place of that future day, not just the to-do list of today, because that's a real, very present reality for him. So chapter 12, or verse 2, chapter, verse, verse, chapter 12, verse 2 says this. Therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may be blameless and pure children of God who are faultless in the crooked and perverted generation among whom you shine like the stars in the world by holding firm to the word of life. Then I can boast in the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing, but even... But even if I am poured out as a drink offering on the sacrificial service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you in the same way you should also be glad and rejoice with me. Let me pray one more time and just ask that God would give us the perspective and a reminder of eternity and help us to live always in light of that. So God, thank you for this verse. Thank you for this reminder that that day matters, that day of Christ matters, that you are working in our lives and that our suffering, our choices, they all have a destination in your plan. So God, in the, the pull that's always around us to urgent, 
to the daily tasks, to the daily grind, to the busyness of the moment. God, help us to lift our eyes through the fog of our moments to see the truth of eternity and live in light of that day. Live in light of that hope and your plan, God. Help us to live with the habit and in light of eternity. God, help this passage to teach us, convict us, and inform us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I want to take about take a few minutes and just look at three kind of reminders, if you will, that, that help us to see the eternal perspective from this passage. And here's the first one. One eternal reminder is that God is working your life and working in you toward a good and powerful purpose. One eternal reminder is that your life is moving someplace with God. Like we tend to kind of get stuck in the moment So God has a plan that he's moving you toward. He's making you more like Jesus. He's pressing your life to be more like him. He's working in your life and he's going to see that work completed. And you see that that idea here in the first couple of verses in uh, in verse 12 and verse 13. Paul says this, Therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence when I'm around, but even more in my absence when I'm not around. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now let's, let's break that down a little bit. Paul begins that verse with the phrase, therefore. That means that he's linking back to all the things he just talked about, which we don't have time to go into this morning. But just to give you a little backdrop, Paul has walked through the person and the model and the example of Jesus in the previous verses. He's shown how Jesus is selfless, how he's humble, how he's always considerate of others, how he was obedient to God, even to the point of death, how he was sacrificed, how he humbled himself, how one day every knee and every tongue will confess and everybody will worship Jesus Christ as Lord. And because of who Jesus is and because of what Jesus has done, Paul is now saying, therefore, continue to obey and work out your salvation. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, I don't want anybody to misunderstand what that means. Paul is essentially saying, in light of what Jesus does and did, work out, work on your salvation. He's not saying earn your salvation or work for your salvation. Like the language is important here. Paul is not saying because Jesus is awesome, you should go work really hard too and be like him. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying that we earn and work for and have to like strive in efforts for our salvation. Paul is saying because Jesus is a model for us and has done all these things for us and has has provided salvation for us, we should work on the salvation he's given us. We We should flesh it out in our lives. It's an application of our salvation, not an earning of our salvation that Paul is talking about. And what he's essentially saying is we should internalize and apply and infuse the salvation that God has given us in all of our areas. We should implement what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Working on our salvation is implementing the reality of the impact of your relationship with Jesus Christ. And your relationship with Jesus Christ has an impact on you. Internally, think about your choices and your attitudes and your thoughts and your habits. Like those should be changed because you know Jesus. And in Jesus, those are different. But even externally, your relationships, the conflict you go through, your actions, how you choose, what you choose to do with your resources, what you choose to do with your time, how you love and how you care for others, all of those are impacted by your salvation. So Paul is saying, work on it. You've been saved, flesh it out in your life. And the reason he's saying this is because this church had a little bit of conflict. The Philippian church had two ladies, and a lot of jokes have been made about these two ladies, but two ladies particularly who were so viciously in conflict that the whole church was being disrupted. And I've seen some conflict in church before. I've been doing pastoral work for many decades, and even from a family that we've served in churches. And so I've seen my share fair of conflict, and it can escalate quickly over things that don't make sense. It's a, you can have a whole lot of conflict without a whole lot of meaning. And so that's essentially what we see here. We don't know what happened. We don't know why. But there are these two ladies that are not getting along. 
and it's taken the whole church with them. And Paul is saying, Christ is amazing. He's humble. He's other-focused. He's died for you. A relationship problem in this church is a salvation problem for this church. Like, work out your salvation. Get along. Be like Jesus. Like, don't just handle and accept conflict, but work on it. Grow up in your salvation. Mature in your salvation. And that's why he even uses the words fear and trembling. Because this should be a serious thing. Like, work out your salvation from a posture of, of aweness and, and fear. Not in a negative way, but, but I need to do this. There's a, there's a oh, seriousness to that. And I got to be honest. When I think about my spiritual growth, and I'm a pastor, fear and trembling is not often the language I would use for how I approach my growth with Christ. Like it's, if I have time, I hope to someday, maybe I'll start doing this. Like we use a whole lot of ifs, not needs, when it comes to our spiritual growth. Like we, we don't have that fear and trembling. I think about the church's storage units. I've been, I've been trying to clean out the church's storage units for six months. And like you get to the end of the day and I'm like, oh, I got an hour. I really don't want to go to the church storage unit and sweat and dig out the story. Like I, and so it becomes like a ambition, not a desire. Like a hopeful, wishful ambition, but not an actual, I need to get this done. Now, the other thing that's interesting, we, we've, had a, we've had a dangling smoke detector in our house for like, for like six months, probably six years. I don't actually know, um, but it hasn't been working. And um, I have felt no urgency to repair it. Um, Pam probably does because she's smart and, and right and all these things. But I got to tell you, when that house blew up and I felt it while study, and I felt it while reviewing my sermon a few weeks ago, I thought to myself, I should get that fixed and add some monoxide and gas detections to it too. Like the, the seriousness went up a notch. Like now there's Amazon cart. Now, now there's smoke detectors in my Amazon cart. Now there's, now there's work being done because the fear is there. The worry is there. And I think that's a great image, right? If we are complacent, we will not grow. If we are not driven, will we not grow? So Paul says, work on your salvation from a place of fear and trembling and necessary. Jesus has done so much for us. Take it seriously to internalize that work. We should have an intensity to living out our salvation. And here's why. God has a plan for your life, and it's a good plan. Look at verse, look at verse 13. Why do, we, why do we work out our salvation with fear and trembling? For it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. God has an eternal purpose for you and me. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says that God who started a good work in you will see it through, will carry it through until completion on the day of Christ Jesus. So, so God has a path and a purpose and a plan for you. And so as we work on our salvation, as we go day by day, you have a plan. God has a plan for you. And that eternal mindset will help us pursue that. Like you're not just thinking about Tuesday anymore. You're thinking that God has a plan for my life and I want to live in it. I want to chase after it. I want to grow in it. I want to be the person God wants me to be. So you can work on your salvation because God is working on you and working in you and has a plan for your life. And that's what our desire should be. We want to see God work. So let's embrace that. Let's, let's make that a reality. God has a long game plan for your life and it's good. And be, we can be, I mentioned this last week, we can be wildly optimistic about that plan. Now, the second part, the second thing, not only does God have a purpose for your life and eternity helps us to focus on that, but well, we need to keep our final and future day before us because that final and future day matters the most. Our final future day matters, matters the most. Look at verse 14. It says, do everything without grumbling and arguing. Parents, this is your favorite verse in the Bible. Do everything, but by the way, we're just as guilty as adults. 
Do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may be blameless and pure children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine like stars in the world. By holding firm to the word of life, then I can boast in the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain or for nothing. Now, I've got to back this up a little bit. This verse, probably not going to like this verse all that much. Do everything without grumbling and complaining. What a simple and hard-hitting call for our lives. But the truth is, that's, that is not as easy to follow as you think it is because I've noticed this in my life. I've noticed this in people's lives. There are many people who all they do is grumble and complain. Their identity, their conversations, their talking points are built on complaints and grumbling. Like their very worth is found in the newest thing to complain about. What's new to complain about today? What did this family member do today? What did this person do today? What did this boss do today? What system is broken now? What happened at work? And so all we do is complain, let alone do nothing without complaining. We're doing everything with complaining. And complaining and grumbling often have a short-sighted view. And I was thinking about this. Most of the things that I complain about will be irrelevant in a day, a week, maybe a year. But they certainly will not be relevant in eternity. Like, I'm complaining about having to drive my kids to school one extra time. Oh, poor you. You've got to spend some time with your kid in the car. Like, it may have interrupted my day, but it'd be, I mean, can you imagine 50 years from now, if, if the Lord lets me live that long, which I highly, highly doubt it based on how I live my life. But in 50 years, in 50 years, if I'm like 92 years old and I'm like, I can't believe I had to drive my kids to Edgewood three times a day on Tuesday, September 3rd. Like that's weird, right? Because it's irrelevant. It's irrelevant today, like what I had to do last week. If you can imagine like some people, that person looked at me weird. I don't like them. That's irrelevant in a little bit. Like we complain about things. Things. My food was too cold. The Chick-fil-A line was too long. I had a long day at school. All those complaints are irrelevant, short-sighted complaints. And they feel good to get out, but they do nothing for the health of our soul. And I really do. Every time we lean into complaining and grumbling, there is a spiritual cost. Because I think it sacrifices. We sacrifice long-term hope for short-term endorphins or whatever. Because complaining feels good, but it does nothing. Fixating on eternity builds our hope and helps us see through maybe some real things to complain about. So instead, instead we're called to do something different. Instead, verse 15 says that we should, we should not complain so that we can be blameless, pure children of God who are faultless in this messed up world. Don't be like the world who complains about everything, but be pure and faultless so that among them you can shine like stars in the world. Meaning you can be an example to Jesus Christ. In a world that complains about everything, you can show the hope of Jesus Christ by fixing on his purposes and his life. How powerful is that? You can be the light of the world and point people to the hope of Jesus Christ just by your attitude. And it's hard to be the light of the world and the light for others when we're so busy complaining about everything else. How will people see a light if we're busy grumbling and complaining? And the Bible, this, this verse gives us two ways we can move past complaining. And they're all fixated on that eternal mindset. See, I don't, I don't think this is a discipline problem. Oh, I just shouldn't say that. This is a, this is a perspective problem. Complaining is not a discipline problem. I think it's a perspective problem. An eternal, an eternity mindset will help fix our complainings because we're looking beyond the moment. Verse, uh, verse 16 gives us the, the picture here. By holding firm to the word of life, then I can boast in the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing. Two things. Hold to Christ. Are you going to hold to complaining or hold to Christ? Hold to his truth, hold to his word, hold to his promises. 
And then Paul says, so that on that day, the day of Christ, we will find that our labor was not in vain. My labor was not in vain. Paul had this obsession to finishing his race, his life well. He, he used his ministry, he used his life, he used the idea of a race to illustrate this. And he had an obsession almost to, to push forward so that he could, he could live toward that day. He didn't want to be disqualified. He didn't want to stumble. And he was obsessed with it. And by the way, I think that's super healthy because I think if more Christians, especially Christian leaders, would be obsessed about that future day, they would stop making silly decisions on this day. And so all of us should have that mentality that that, that day matters most. That day is the most important day. And that's why 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, Paul says, I fought the fight. I finished the race. I have kept the faith. Don't you want that to be some of your final words? I have fought this fight and I've won. I've finished the race and I've done well. And I've kept holding to Christ through all of this. And grumbling and complaining and all sorts of other distractions will pull you from that race, not help you in that race. And it's an eternal mindset that says, when I, my life is done, that day matters more than this day. That day is most important than this day. And that just changes so much about how we live. Because our choices are so fueled by what I want now, not what I want then. That day matters most. When we live for that day, it changes how we live this day today. Now, here's the, here's the last point as I got I to gotta keep plowing through. I'd love to let that linger and help apply that better. The third point is that temporary suffering can lead to eternal joy. Here's a good eternal reminder. If you have a perspective of eternity, not only is this day different, but how you suffer is different. Philippians verse seven, 2 verse 17 Paul says, even if I am poured out as a drink offering on the sacrificial service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. In the same way, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. Now, Paul, Paul makes this thing sober really fast. Even if my life is sacrificed, if, even if I'm executed, even if I stay in prison, and he uses the illustration, even if my life is poured out like a drink as a sacrifice for your faith, I mean, this, this Philippians church exists because Paul went there, preached the gospel, spent some time in prison there, like got attacked by people. I mean, it was, he, Paul suffered for this church. He was ultimately arrested for the gospel. So Paul says, even if I am poured out for your faith, for your benefit, I can be glad and I can find hope and I can rejoice. In the same way, and he, he invites them in to suffer with him or to rejoice with him because of his suffering. What he's saying is there is a bigger picture than my temporary suffering because there is an eternal hope. And man, that is a good mindset to have. That your momentary suffering, if done for Jesus, if done for the glory of God, if done with a perspective for eternity, doesn't just have to be a a drag and a hurt and a hardship, it can be a joy because you're building yourself up for the glory of God and his purposes. That long-term gain, can, division can bring joy. And the truth is God loves, God has a habit of using temporary suffering and pain to build toward his eternal purposes. That's why we can pray in our suffering like we see around in our county. We pray suffering when we see tragedies happen. God be glorified in this because God can churn hurt and pain and loss for his good and eternal purposes because all things work out for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. That's what God does. So suffering, it looks different when you focus on eternity. And imagine if you can lift your eyes from the pain of the moment the struggles of the moment toward eternity, it changes how you live. My, uh, my friend Richard, I, I don't have time to go. I, I'm going to do it. We'll be fine. The nursery people will love me. Um, my friend Richard, I know I've talked about him before. We're, we're Fortnite buddies, and uh, we've, we're, we're kind of a problem together, so we, have to, we should probably limit our time. But um, 
He was, he was given a terminal cancer, cancer diagnosis in 2021, a week or two before he started his church. Like first Sunday, he was given a terminal. You have two to three years cancer diagnosis. Some weird, um, not a normal cancer, but a very rare cancer that they didn't catch. And so they said, you got two to three years to live. And so what do you want to do? And most of us would be like, well, I'm going to party. I'm going to spend time with my wife. Like he was, he's 20 something years old, like young guy. And um, he said, well, God called me to plan a church. And when God called me to plant a church, he knew that I had cancer. And so he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plant a church like I have two years left to live, and I'm going to throw it all for the glory of God. And here's the, here's the cool thing. Earlier this year, he got, he was just kept getting sick. Obviously, he's dying of cancer. He kept getting sick and like colds and congestion. And so he was, he was just getting sick and sick and sick. And... Um, he went in for a scan because they like to check your cancer to see how, like he, he says, they like to see how dead I am, um, is what he tells. He's pretty, pretty sick, I know, but that's what he does. That's what he did. He's like, they go and they scan my cancer to see how dead I am. And uh, they're like, they kind of like, the doctor came in, it's like, the cancer is 30% less. Like it's shrunk. And like now they've changed him from being terminal to being like, now they're not talking about years, they're talking about decades on his life. And they're trying to figure out what happened. Like, the doctors are blown away, confused. Of course, you know, we know prayer. We know, we know God's working. But they actually, the doctor said, we think when you kept getting sick with the colds this year, it triggered some kind of hyper response in your life that the, your immune system started attacking the cancer as well as the cold. And so, so, they're, so they're, now they're giving, now they're making him sick, right? Isn't that crazy? Now they're making him sick on purpose. Now they're like, well, let's give you all kinds of colds. Um, a common cold saved his life. So like, God can use temporary suffering for his eternal purposes. In the broader scope of eternity, God can use your momentary hurt for a greater healing, a greater hope. And it may not be that miraculous healing like he experienced. It may be just in the future eternity when you celebrate the goodness of God in heaven, that's where we see it and that is our hope. So let's do this. Let's, let's adopt an eternal mindset. All of our choices, all of our decisions, let's shift toward that mindset. And so I want to ask you this question as we put, throw it up on the screen. Ask God what needs to shift in your life so that you can live in light of eternity. Maybe that first choice is just having a relationship with Jesus, committing to Jesus Christ who died for your sins. We believe that, that all of us are, are lost without God. We've, we've fallen short of his plan. We've sinned. We've done things outside of his plan. And the only way to have a restored relationship with God is to find forgiveness through Jesus Christ. We can't earn it. We can't work it. We can't work on it, if you will. We have to, we have to receive salvation from Jesus. Jesus came, God's son, lived a perfect and sinless life, died on the cross for our brokenness, our wrong. And to receive that gift, that forgiveness, that healing, that restoration, we repent from our sins, believe in Jesus, and commit our lives to him. That might be your first step now to having that eternal mindset. And I would encourage you in that step. Um, maybe for others, it's just kind of trying to find a way to lift out of the grind to see the glory of God. So let's do this. Let's pray as we wrap up our sermon, to see our, our series today.